Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking to Jeff Becker, who's the Managing Director of the MSR Group, Motorsports Safety and Rescue. Jeff started the company more than 20 years ago, is they operate in a very interesting space because they do a lot of testing and engineering verification for a lot of automotive brands around the world. So it allows them to be at that pointy tip and get a good understanding of what's happening in the industry. They also run a large number of events, both for motorsport and for car launches. They run a number of fleets for a number of very large corporates, and they do a lot of vehicle logistics. So this always puts them at that pointy tip of the business to understand what's new and what's happening. So I'm really excited to chat to Jeff. So let's jump into it. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Jeff, thanks very much for joining us today. Maybe to kick things off, you do a lot in the engineering space and engineering verification for companies and automotive companies around the world. Can you tell us what you do and some of the trends you're seeing in the market at the moment? There's a couple of areas that we, we're involved in with the engineering. The first one is we recently finished a, a major project for an overseas company where we had their pre-production vehicles and they had some new technology in them and they wanted to make sure that they were, were right. And they also wanted to make sure that the um, some of the features worked properly in this country because of some variances in road signs and all that and making sure that the ride and handling was okay and taking those vehicles from the coldest to the hottest to the most humid um, locations in Australia and spending time getting valuable data, which goes back to the company and obviously their engineers uh, look at it and take it from there. It's an interesting field because there's a lot of stuff involved in it. It's not just simply going out there, driving a car, and data logging is it's not that simple it's driving the car in the normal manner that should be not exceeding the speed limit seeing how the automatic sign recognition works making sure that the adaptive cruise control is fine works properly in this environment and it's all the, that gamut of things including you know do the uh, doors open properly do the do, it, do the seats move halfway through it? They'll change the program, upgrade the program, so you repeat the stuff. So it is repetitive. It is interesting. And it certainly brings you up with what's really happening out there in the real world. The second part is, is that ADAS testing with where there's comparisons with other vehicles. And there's a lot of that goes on in this country, which people would never know about. They're not camouflage cars. They're just the lightest speck of a car. We will source uh, the alternate cars that they want with the specification that they want for that. And then we get a list of about 400 things that they're to look at as they go around driving. And then they take that data away and compare it and that that's happening a lot. And Jeff, is Australia quite a unique country to be chosen for testing? Or is this testing done in a lot of countries around the world? It's done in a lot of countries around the world, but I think what Australia does, it, it is unique. Like our road surfaces in the outback are so different to what anyone's sort of used to. The other thing is that we're close to... Where we're based at Tullamarine, we're very close to the city. So we can do city driving, we can do country driving, we can do freeways, highways. Obviously, Melbourne's a major transport hub, um, shipping hub. Sorry, whether the cars get freighted in, air freight, or come on the ship, but usually it's air freight. Cars you source, do you buy them outright or do you just rent them from a rental company? We've got a supplier that we do long-term rentals with and those cars 
go back with no damage. That's the whole aim of it. That um, you know, our, our criteria is really strict. One of our KPIs is uh, no speeding infringements, that sort of stuff. So there's expected to be good behaviour on the drivers. And Jeff, what are some of the trends you're starting to see? The cars are coming probably to market a bit quicker than what they used to. And therefore, the testing is very condensed and the expectation to get it done is much higher than it used to be. We often run two to three shifts on those vehicles to get everything that they want done, and that's what they require. If I can use an example, I went to a safety briefing of an OEM some years ago, and the technology was quite exciting for passenger, especially passenger survivability in, in, in motor crashes. And the interesting part was that that come out about six to seven years after seeing the initial product. So, But now we're seeing stuff done on much more on the fly. The other thing is that we've found is that the tune on some of the ADAS stuff for Australia needs to be done in Australia to get it right because if it's set in some countries, um, the cars can be very aggressive on on lane change, et cetera. And so car companies are really looking for that reassurance that when they get here that the car won't misbehave in a way that's going to be detrimental to the brand. And Jeff, you saw a lot of testing around safety at one stage of the crumple zones and seven airbags and all those type of things in the car. Where is the focus now? Is it more on the reaction of the car because you're getting ABS and, as you mentioned, now lane change and those type of warnings, 360 yeah. cameras and that. Where is the focus now? Safety. The focus on Australian tune is is more limited and you could name on your hand the companies that do do Australian tunes. A lot of them claim to say they do, but they don't. The thing we're seeing is it's more about the safety systems in the car. It's it's definitely more about the AEB, lane departure, the adaptive cruise control. Also, there's testing some of the plug-in hybrids, just to see how much difference they make out in certain situations, like if we're testing a four-wheel drive, for example, that's a plug-in hybrid. It's interesting to get real data on what sort of kilowatt use that we're using, so it's, it's interesting. And in terms of autonomous vehicles, Jeff, where do you see that going? What's happening in that space? We've heard so much about it, and I think in Phoenix they've got vehicles actually driving being tested at the moment in, in Arizona. Is that happening here or are you getting involved in that type of thing? At the moment, we, we're restricted to level two. Realistically, with the flick of a switch, we could go to level three with a safety driver. It wouldn't be hard for us to do it, but it needs a, you know some approval from the traffic authorities to do that. I don't potentially see the problems that people say that's out there. I'm not convinced that those problems are as as bad as what people say they are. What sort of problems are people mentioning? Well, there's still the concern about obviously adaptive cruise control and how efficient it is and what it does and how does it work and Um, Is that safe? Uh, Can you rely on it to slow you down? Can you rely on it to to accelerate up when if the the vehicle, the overtaking? On on a test ground, there has been opportunities where the testing in a private environment, you can put the vehicle on autonomous driving and not, I'd say it just takes all the pressure off the driver, but with the current requirements to touch the steering wheel every 10 seconds. I think that, you know, that's a good thing and it stops people from, you know, some of the incidents as we've seen from the States where people are reading a book and all that sort of stuff. I I think that those 
that vision and the vision of cars running into fire appliances and et cetera, et cetera, around the place, that's what really hurts that program. I think that uh, there's a lot of people out there saying that they're doing a lot of things about it. I'm not sure we see the commitment through through government. And, the, and our biggest other problem is too that some of this testing goes on without even the OEM in this country knowing about it, and that's one of the requirements that we are not to disclose that the vehicle's in the country. So that makes it hard. It's not just simply picking up a vehicle, taking it for a drive, you know, uh, we, the autonomous driving, you know, to level two is really good. Uh, we want to know what it'll do in lots of situations. You know, hook turns is a beauty in, in, in Melbourne. One particular manufacturer got us to stay two more days just for driving around Melbourne, around the hook turns, so that they could get it through themselves, got the concept, so that they could make the necessary changes in, in their program. Yeah, so, that's, that's quite fascinating. I just, you know, I've never thought of that. So it's really interesting that you brought that up. Yeah. I think Melbourne must be one of the few cities in the world that has a hook to it. Yeah, it is. And, uh, it, yeah, they get here and we, we might have a engineer come out and they're just blown away by it. You know, what what's this? I can't work out what you're doing. And it, it, it's interesting. Victoria's been and Transurban have been pretty active about uh, autonomous vehicles. They recently had a truck trial on the um, Monash and went from the city up to Dandenong and back. It did have a safety driver and a number of escorts and and from all accounts that went really well. That was pleasing to see and it would be good if we can sort of work with companies like Transurban to do a little bit more of that. Because one of the things in a previous podcast we did People were talking about the challenge of fully autonomous cars is they need the line markings on the road. And yeah. so they can't go out and gravel roads or into the outback. Is, is that correct? Is that something that, or are they overcoming that? They're working to overcome that. You know, obviously for fully autonomous cars, you'd want to be driving them on good roads with good line markings. You know, we, we use the aids like adaptive cruise control in those places. Lane departure obviously doesn't work because the car can't pick up that you're moving to another side. So that, that makes it a little bit difficult. So that is one of the one of the challenges moving forward. And the other thing they were talking about is the sensors. They said the you have to keep them clean all the time. But if, you, if they're not clean, you might have issues with that. Is that true or not? Have you picked up um, anything on that? No, we don't deliberately go and clean the car every day. Uh, we'll run around a couple of the major sensors that we know could have an impact on the testing, but in most cases, no. We'll do a visual check that they're all okay and, you know, strain gauges might be there. I'm just making sure they're still in place and those sorts of things. But the way that the car's monitored is varied. You know, the data logger is is put through the... Uh, connected through the OBD port, and then there's other sensors that come into the to the uh, data logger from different areas. So they get a pretty good picture of what's going on all the time. And the other thing is that the companies watch it from overseas, so they can actually log in and see the car moving, follow it on a map, that sort of stuff. So yeah. And do they keep quite close track of you, what you're doing? Oh, definitely. Uh, we get sent set criteria of types of roads that we are to use and those percentages uh, are required to be met. And um, so, so it's a bit hard sometimes. You might be like they're not going to be upset about 1% or 2%, but they like it as close as possible. And... In some incidences, that also includes towing tests. So, you know, we, we'll hire a caravan and do some towing tests just to see they can see what it does and what effect it has on the vehicle. Now, Jeff, you've also done a lot of work with electric vehicles and you've done a lot of testing on electric vehicles. And we've started to see new incentives coming in now from 
government that we're going to start incentivizing electric vehicles in Australia. What are some of the challenges do you think that the government needs to get their head around with all these new electric vehicles coming in from your experience? First of all, I think the major issue is infrastructure. And the other point I'll make with that is working infrastructure. There is so often you're relying on a a charger at a location and it's showing up on the app that it's all good to go and you get there and it's it's been out of action apparently for you know a week. That does impact on the sorts of stuff that or where people can travel to. I'm I'm not so convinced that range anxiety is the big issue that it used to be. I think people are uh, more selective than that now. I had an electric car loaned to me to trial for a little while and I actually loved it. It was it was convenient. Uh, I live in the south, south southeast suburbs and uh, out to Tullamarine and, you know, I'd come home of a night and just plug it into the car from the normal 240 and the next morning it would be charged and and only really needed to charge it probably every two or two and a half days. It was just it was just so good. It, it wasn't an inconvenience to go and get fuel because you were just plugging it in when you got home. And obviously we had the ability to, you know, charge at work. And in terms of the different types of charges, what has been your experience with what you've... Because you were the first company to bring in a DC charger, is that right? EVs sort of come out as pretty quick. And what we found was that uh, there hadn't been a lot of consideration to charging the vehicles. And especially when, from an event point of view, people would say, you know, we want to go to this location, this location, and on on the reconnaissance you find out that that location has a seven kilowatt charger and you've got 15 cars to charge. So we we bought the DC charger in. It's worked very well for us at launches. It's also worked well for us on test programs. And at the moment one company has actually got it on a, um, a, a test program that they're running for two weeks in New South Wales. So, and then that'll be picked up on on Friday and then it'll move to the Brisbane area for another event. So we've found that it helps supplement what's around and being DC charge, it just is much quicker than the old AC charge. And um, we, we just... Yeah, it's 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 been for us a bit of a, a lifesaver in the fact that we can you know bring the cars up to a certain level and then, then even if we have to we can put them on a on a trickle charge to finish the other 20%. But it certainly gets used and once again it's latest technology. It's um it, it sends to your phone when the car's charged. It uh, you can look at it and see wh- how far the cars charge from where you are, and there are all sorts of advantages with it that uh, we think are, are really, really good. And does it work on a trailer? Do you just how, how does that charger work? Do you just tie it to your venue where you're going to help? Yeah, hold it's the not. It's not. It's 120 kilos. It's on. It's on wheels. It's not that hard to move. We've got it in the back of a utility at the moment, and. Uh, we just unload that and unload it from that, and we've got some ramps for it, and uh, it works well. It's not as big as some people expect it to be. They they sort of uh, expect this massive machine, and it actually isn't. We saw that from Finland through an associate that uh, uh, knew the company over there that had developed it and had other dealings with them, and um, we got it air freighted out, and it was... It's as I said, it's really saved us a number of occasions. Now, Jeff, you run a number of fleets or companies. Can you explain how that fleet market is changing, especially with electric vehicles coming in? You say it's the autonomous cars. Ninety percent of our events now are EV or or plug-in hybrid. We're seeing the fleets change to more EV. There's a lot more change in, to to the EV model, um, so that's certainly a major thing that we've we've seen. So, you know, it wasn't unusual to have 
one or two vehicles in the in each of the locations we're at that were EV. Well, now it would be probably over fifty percent of the vehicles in the in the fleets are, are EV. And is the length of time companies are holding vehicles is that changing? Because at once you know, private buyer will hold his vehicle for say eight years, I think on average. Yep. But companies used to hold their vehicles say three four years. Is that changing now? We haven't seen that because I don't think we've had cars out of here long enough to uh, find out when people are going to change. I suppose the the issue will be on the used car market is what's the battery status when they buy the car because the battery status has got a use-by date uh, where they suggest that you should be taking it out of the car and replacing it, and that that's not a cheap exercise. I think that'll, that'll affect it a bit. The companies will will do what they normally do. They'll get rid of them at three and four years. And I think the consumer will get wiser that they need to be a little bit more battery savvy and will probably move towards trade-ins if their um, their car is starting to drop off on its battery capacity. And, And with all the information you get on these cars, that's there to see. It's it's not something that can be hidden. So it'll be interesting to see. I think the other thing that needs to be considered, and this is changing the subject a little bit, is that we can't forget about hydrogen. My my belief is that in time we will have hydrogen cars that will be supplemented with potentially an EV battery for for a small EV battery just for those emergency situations of breakdowns. I, I'm very much convinced that hydrogen is the way to go. And it's, it's not the car technology once again. You know, Mercedes-Benz ran 10 years ago, ran three cars across Australia that were hydrogen cars and they brought in international journalists to to drive those cars. So the car technology is well, it's there. You know, in this country at the moment, we've got two manufacturers that have brought in hydrogen cars and that's the Toyota Group and, and Hyundai. And I think it's really brave of them to do that. But we see moves afoot for a a highway, hydrogen highway, similar to what they're saying with EVs. And uh, I think that that will be, I think in time we'll see a shift to that. And I'd nearly go as far as to say that that will take over from EVs, especially in the, the truck and coach areas. And the problem that has been is that people say, well, I'm out the bush. What am I going to do now? You know, five years' time, you'll be able to plug your electrolyzer in and, you know, your solar panels will go into it and you'll produce your own hydrogen. That's not a silly idea anymore. That's realistic. And But I still see ICE vehicles being with us for a while. I, I think that people... Uh, are naive to think that that the fact that the government has put a mandated time when ICE vehicles can't come into the country, I, I tend to agree with the ex-chairman of the Toyota in Japan who said that uh, it's, it's all right to have EVs, it's all right to have hydrogen cars, but you've also got to have an infrastructure and there will be lots of places that won't have that infrastructure that will need, still need those ice cars uh, produced. And so I think that's very interesting and I, I, and I think it's a very valid point. I, I don't think that we'll see the total end of those cars, you know, overnight. It's not going to happen. But I think we're definitely seeing, uh, going back to hydrogen, that as you said, I think the technology is there. It's been there for a long time. The challenge they had in the past was the storage and the the filling of the vehicles. But yep. I think they've overcome that. I think they've made good inroads in how to do that. I see there's been quite a lot of testing in America, on especially for big trucks. 
Yep, we're making some inroads there. It is, and I, I've got uh, an associate I know quite well who's in that space, and he builds refuelers. And so, you know, that's that's now a real market for, you know, people to have. And I see that in time, and I don't see it that far away, for the operation that we run, we're going to have to have the ability to fill a hydrogen car. That's it's just the way it's going to be. Yeah, you could siphon some off on a, out of a bottle, but it's, it's not much. And the pressure required to put those, those that into the cars is so high. You really do need a proper refuel system to do that because, you know, they're going in at 350 and 700 bar, depending on which manufacturer, and that's pretty high pressures to have in the car. And I say this with a bit of caution. I'm a believer that the hydrogen cars are safer than the electric vehicles in a crash situation um, because with the hydrogen cars, if they they get any sort of interruption to the, the fueling line and the tank, it immediately vents. Well, It doesn't take long for five kilograms of compressed hydrogen to get into the atmosphere. It's gone. Whereas EVs, and I think it's a problem that that some of the government fire departments are having now, is working out the appropriate protocol for EV fires. And only yesterday there was an article about uh, an EV fire of a European brand and that car burnt to the ground and took the truck with it and it wasn't moving. And I think that people need to get their heads around the fact that battery electric vehicles have a significantly safe, but if the battery does get that interruption and that chemical reaction starts and it doesn't need oxygen to do that, that's when they become a nightmare to manage and that's obviously why we have protocols about when the cars can be on charger and when they can't. We've got the monitoring system so we can see which what's on the chargers at all times and what how much they're taking and all the rest of it and we can also stop the, the charger remotely. The problem is one day in in a situation in a car park, it will happen and it will be difficult to manage. And I think that people as a as an industry, the OEMs need to be helping the fire services deal with these issues because th- these fires require a lot of water. If they get a thermal run on the the, the car will just burn for however long it can be extinguished then put on a tow truck and then it'll might start again they've had them up to three weeks where they've actually reignited and so that becomes uh, an issue with those cars and at the moment a country fire brigade unit isn't going to come down with 10,000 gallons of water to to pour onto a car it's just just not going to happen. We see in Scandinavia where they use a system, the fire brigade over there, where they've got a, a picker truck and they've got a container system and they just drop the car into the water, into the container, and that's it. The, it's left there to, to to once it's stopped so that the risk is, is taken out of it. That's the worry that I see and there is some nasty gases can come out of that battery. But talking to a colleague I know quite well in in America who works for a major battery company was saying that they're just about to start 3D printing and also they're looking at lithium and other combinations that aren't as volatile, that should still give the range. I think that the, the development of the batteries is going ahead and hopefully that that it helps with the safety of them because you know um you'd want to get the people out of the car straight away and you know our advice to people that we go on launches if uh, you smell a fire pull pull up get out of the car 
make sure it's turned off, disengage the electric system if you can. If you can't, you can't, and get 30 metres away from it. We run a fire car fire blanket, which is put over the car. It doesn't put the battery fire out, but what it does do is protects the around you, so it protects from you know, the forest, if it happens out in the middle of, um, you know, on the road to Dalesford or somewhere like that. So it, 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 you can, from our situation, protect it. And uh, I'm not sure where the fire brigade in Melbourne is at. I certainly know that New South Wales is is doing a major study on it now. And hopefully we'll, we'll get some decent answers uh, for it so that we can you know, at least have something to think. There is a special fire, uh, fire extinguisher that's out, but once again, you've got to be there when it starts. And how do you get to a sealed in battery unit? You know, everyone says to me, oh, you can get into it straight away. And I'm going, well, how do you get into it? Underneath it, it's got a, 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 a significant metal protection system. You're not going to get into it that easy, and one fire extinguisher isn't going to put it out. So here's a problem. There's I've heard and I've not been able to confirm it, but some Melbourne towies apparently have decided that they won't be carting electric cars, damaged electric cars, because uh, they're not prepared to take the risk. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be thought about. Because the other thing is not just the safety which you speak about here, it's just the rare earth metals. And if every single car is an electric vehicle, you know, where are they going to be mining these earth metals from? You know, is it the bottom of the sea and how much damage could that do to the environment? So I think there's a lot of, I think electric vehicles have a very good space there, but I don't know if they can be the whole solution. Oh, I totally agree. There will be, there will be part of the solution, but we also need to find other solutions at the same time. We haven't uh, seen the end of development on ice motors, which will, there's also biofuels. We've got Porsche starting a factory down in Bernie, Tasmania next year to produce e-fuels. So for me, I'm a bit excited that we're not just from where we sit as an organisation, we're just not linked into the whole EV system. We seriously believe in hydrogen and the e-fuels will have a have a part in where we head, and I think it's going to be a combination of all those things. Do you want to talk anything about motorsport? Because you do quite a bit of motorsport safety. Used to, you used to. Um, we're not so involved in that anymore because it's just become so much more difficult and regulated with. And I'm not saying it shouldn't. Or it was regulated before, but the regulations are are very tight and. Like any organisation, we we would used to pay for our people to go to events. Uh, we paid all their expenses. We flew them up there. We made sure they were fed and watered and and uh, looked after and f- get to fly back home. But they donated their time. And I think the challenge that we'll face motorsport is that people are being a little bit more guarded with their with their time and it's really sad to go to some events and I look around and they're all people my age or older and I think where are the where where are we going to get the backfill it to me is a major issue that's, that's going to loom and and it is going to have an impact on the sport I, I think that it's not so clear cut is where motorsport safety is heading. I think that my business partner is still running that part of the business. He, he's got that operating. And the investment of equipment and the throwouts of equipment that are out of date is just horrendous. You know, we've done events like the World Rally Championship and for that event, you have to have specific equipment. It's all all dictated to by the FIA, and it's not used anywhere else. So you're buying this equipment for one event, and uh, it might have a a useful life of two years. 
in the end, I, I for me personally, I just found it really frustrating that was happening. I think our expertise was in in rally and in the area of long distance endurance events like the Australian Safari and events like that. So um, for me, that was the part that I enjoyed the most because it was it's very it's 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 a lot of you can get a lot of joy out of setting all the all the schedules for that sort of stuff and making sure it was right and and for me personally that's how I got into motorsport I, I personally had no interest uh, in it at all uh, in fact just the opposite and uh, when I was with ambulance. Uh, I was instructed that on the first target that I was the ambulance coordinator. To be honest with you, I'd done a report that I've still got to this day, and I thought after that, that's me. I won't get asked again. All, all's good. and all. Um, But then I was dobbed in to do more, and then I built some relationships which with some really good people that are real close mates, and uh, I think that's the one thing about rally probably compared to other type form motorsport. So for me, that's where my my passion and my love was for that sort of stuff. And the round Australia's were just like you couldn't run them now. You wouldn't be allowed to because of the regulations. But in the days that we'd done it in 95, 98, I just I pull out the photos occasionally and and you just go through them and just think of the wonderful memories that those sort of events had and uh yeah it's uh there's many many stories in that vault jeff you've very much involved in launches for oems and vehicle manufacturers can you tell us how that is changing and what's happening in that sort of space yeah well i suppose the biggest change we're seeing is that uh 90 percent of the launches we're doing are uh, ev or phev i think that's that's Firstly, the big thing that we're seeing, and that goes with manufacturers pushing the cars to the the, the limit of their uh, range as per their claims. There's none of this avoidance of distance, and I think the automotive media have got that whole issue about range sorted. And even recently, I was in a small vehicle. And that actually exceeded the range, which absolutely blew me out of the water because it was the last thing I was expecting to see. And that particular vehicle was on a test program and it wasn't an easy test program. So I think that that stuff does make a difference. Obviously, when they tell you they're going somewhere and you go, okay, what's the charging situation there? That's when it becomes a bit of a... A problem for us because uh, most of these are overnight trips and people stay the night and then the manu- OEM or the manufacturer wants the car ready for in the morning with a full charge and um, that's the challenge that we see. There's also how we get people around those drive programs on the drive program that we want them to follow. That's been a very interesting uh, process. We had a machine from Belgium that used to go in the cars and that would give instructions that we would put in like like a road book you would see at a rally. We've moved to a new system now. Some of the manufacturers, their systems are so good that we can use their own mapping systems, but it's all there. They're the big challenges now is getting to understand each manufacturer's uh, infotainment centre to, to be able to do this stuff. That's that's the thing that we're finding is a bit of a challenge. So events are very different to what they used to be. You know, if we go back to the uh, very early 90s, there, there were horrible stories of people doing suicidal speeds, but we just don't see that anymore. That that's gone. The people rely on their licenses for their livings, and and um, you know we we just really just have been blessed with the fact that the message has got through. So the old issues of car control and speed and all that sort of stuff are now much better, and um, we certainly put the onus back onto the 
the driver to work within the appropriate speed limit. So that's that's another change in culture that we've seen over the last 15 years. And in terms of the type of events, Jeff, do you just do a long country drive or do you take them to on a skid pan or on a high-speed oval? Do you do those type of activities? Yeah, we do, we do a bit of everything. Certainly with EVs, we like to put them for a little bit in the environment that they will spend their most time. But on the same token, a driver can't really evaluate the car well from doing a city drive. So they need some need to be taken out of the city and given some road that they can actually drive the car and see what it's right and handling are like. So they're the sorts of things that are the challenge. Yes, we do do some country roads, we do gravel roads, we will do gravel, you know, we'll do off-road tracks depending on the vehicle. Uh, we do go to facilities like Anglesey and Mount Cotton, uh, the, the two that come to mind that we can do all that stuff in a controlled environment and can pick the degree of uh, difficulty that we that we want to highlight. Because that's one of the challenges of electric vehicles is that because they're so quiet and you've got the, high, the quick acceleration that people can lose control very easily. Do you cover yeah. that in some of the when you're doing the launching and training? Oh, we do, we do a briefing at the start and push the point that people need to remember that these cars are a lot quieter. Um, be very careful at you know near traffic lights and, and crossings because people mightn't have heard you pulling up. So just be careful. It, once again, it, it comes back on the onus of uh, the driver. Some vehicles uh, have an exhaust tune that can be played. So there's a you know a noise that replicates the exhaust. Driving up to someone in a, in a car that makes no noise, when I experienced that 10 years ago with Mercedes in, in Sydney, I went with the um, chief development officer of the hydrogen project and we went for a ride around Sydney. And the amount of people, you go up and they'd start, they, they were walking and they didn't see you or they didn't hear you, so they just immediately would... You know, wouldn't wait for the light to turn green, you know, green for them. They, they just keep going. So that was a challenge in the, the when it was first in. But I think people are people are getting used to them, and there is a bit of road noise with them, tire noise. So I think that that will you know helps that that system. Artificial exhausts. I'm not sure about. You know, I, I think this whole question of what what sort of world do we want? And to me, adding an, another high pitched uh, you know noise that's not re- really required. Do do we need it? And with the at our stuff that's in the vehicles, the driver gets plenty of warning if someone's you know behind them or beside them or in front of them. And so you know, I think that makes a big difference too. Yeah, Jeff, well, thanks very much. I really enjoyed chatting to you today. I think we covered some very interesting topics about what's happening in the industry. Thanks, John. Uh, I've enjoyed it too, and I think that I'm looking forward to seeing the, this out, and I, I just think it's great when you can sit down and have a conversation openly about how you perceive or what you're seeing in the industry because that doesn't happen very often where you know, you, you're closely guarded in what you can say and what you can't say. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Really fascinating getting that first-hand experience of what it is at that pointy tip of the business. Uh, Just getting that little insight into new things happening in the market. Uh, If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. And we'll speak to you again next week. (music) 